That's so nice, Anna, that you have come all the way from Liverpool to visit us here in our solitary house in the forest and to listen to the old stories of your old teacher. And uh, to begin with, let me treat you with something. I have to go and get it from the kitchen. Just a moment. Let me treat you to the mathematician's delight. I've bought I've bought a toy, magnetic sticks and balls with which you can make nice geometric constructions. Maybe when you go back to Liverpool you can take it as a present to Rachel. I don't know whether would she play with some such a thing? Sure. Okay, so I'll I give one, I'll give it to you. And um, <clears throat> I've made here, I've constructed the um, five platonic solids. These are, yeah, that's not completely regular, that's unstable, you know that very well. <clears throat> so these are the five regular polyhedra. A polyhedron is <clears throat> a body in three dimensional space, compact, convex and bounded by a finite number of hyperplanes. And these things have vertices and edges and faces. And um, let's look at them more closely. Let's begin here with the simplest one. That's the tetrahedron. It has four triangular faces. The next one is the octahedron. <clears throat> it has eight triangular faces. And after that comes the most beautiful one. It's the icosahedron, which has 20 triangular faces. And then there are two other ones, which are dual to these. Here is the cube, uh, excuse me, the hexahedron, which everybody knows, but um, it is dual to the octahedron. If you take the, the six centers of its six faces, they are the vertices of the octahedron. And vice versa, if you take the eight centers of the triangles of the octahedron, they are the vertices of the cube. These constructions were known from antiquity. In a similar way, <clears throat> the icosahedron is dual to the dodecahedron. These objects um, are today are easy to describe. If you have the proper definition of what a regular polyhedron is, then it is an easy task to prove that there are only these five regular solids. But at the time when these things were discovered by the Greek mathematicians, it was a great discovery and it had enormous importance for Greek philosophy. And to begin with, I think we should read a certain short uh, sequence uh, in a dialogue of Plato. The dialogue is called Timaios, Timaios was the name of one of the participants of the dialogue. At the point uh, which, I, which I have in mind, they talk about the state of uh, the elements, air, fire, water, earth, uh, before the world was uh, created uh, in its present cosmic order by some demiurge, by some god. And... Uh, let me now read to you, I have an English translation here in my German book, what he says. <clears throat> Before that time, in truth, all these things were in a state devoid of reason or measure. 
But when the work of setting in order this universe was being undertaken, fire and water and earth and air, although possessing some traces of their own nature, were yet so disposed as everything is likely to be in the absence of God. And inasmuch as this was their natural condition, God began by first making them out into shapes by means of forms and numbers, and that God constructed them so far as he could to be as fair and good as possible, whereas they had been otherwise, this above all, above all else must always be postulated in our account. Note, Anna, that this is a confession of faith of Occidental science, or at least it has been its creed for 2,000 years. Lately, I mean in the 19th century, some philosophers like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche began to have doubts about this creed. And for instance, Felix Hausdorff, on whose biography I'm working, once said, Ich glaube nicht an Kosmos, Logos, Nomos, als a priori feststehendes Ergebnis aller Wissenschaft, höchstens als glücklichenfalls erreichbares. I try to translate, I don't believe in cosmos, logos, nomos, as a result of all science established a priori, but at best as something to be achieved if we are lucky. For Plato, the regular solids were the mathematical forms that represented the cosmological order. The tetrahedron represented fire because it's so cute, uh, the octahedron, the air, the cube, which is solid, the earth, and the icosahedron, uh, water. Now, there were only four elements, but he had five polyhedra, so what to do with the last one? So it represented uh, the cosmic order and its beauty as seen in the sky. Let me show you a picture, or rather a drawing, from the wonderful book Harmonice Mundi of Johannes Kepler. I love it. Here, on page 79, you see the five platonic solids. And they are decorated so as to show the relation to Plato's theory of elements. Here's the tetrahedron, fire. Here's the octahedron, air. Here's the cube, earth. Here's the icosahedron, water. And then there's the fifth one representing the order and beauty of the cosmos to be seen in the sky, that's the dodecahedron. Isn't that beautiful? Kepler's book is a testimony for the fact that the Greek belief in cosmic nature of our world and the science of shapes and numbers, i.e. mathematics, is the means of recognizing this order. Kepler's book is a testimony to this fact that this is deep at the roots of Occidental science.